Hey everybody and welcome to the Startup Savant Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan, and this show is about the stories, challenges, and triumphs of fast scaling startups and the founders who run them. Our guest on the show today is Andy Choi. Andy is the founder and CEO of Do Good Points, a company working to bridge the gap between nonprofits and individuals seeking to make a difference in the world. At just 14, Andy started his first company, and within a few years, he was seeing success that any founder would be proud of, not just someone in their teens. And I'm being intentionally vague about this business because I want Andy to give us the story behind this venture. And I've read a little bit about it, and I'm stoked to get all the details and share them with all of you. But before we jump in, I want to tell you about another podcast that I've been listening to lately. It's called Cashing Out, and it's put together by the folks over at ExitWise. Similar to this show, they bring on entrepreneurs to tell stories and gather insights, but instead of current startup founders, they interview folks who have successfully exited a business. I've really enjoyed listening, so if you are interested in the later stages of the entrepreneurial journey, go check out the Cashing Out podcast. I mean, once you're finished with this episode, of course. We will put the link in the show notes. All right, enough preamble. Let's get into this conversation with Andy Choi of Do Good Points. Andy, how's it going today? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Ethan? I'm doing great. We are living the dream out here in Ann Arbor and uh, yeah. just waiting for that sun to come out. It might happen sometime this year. I, I, I just know it will. <laughs> yep, another day in paradise. Exactly. All right, so I teased this episode um, by saying that you had an interesting business when you were 14. Um, can you tell us a lot more about uh, about this venture that you had when you were just a lad? Yeah, um, like, like every teen, I was looking for my first job, right, at like 13, but I was pretty aggressive um, in regards to like, I, I wanted to work, I wanted to make money, I had a lot of things I wanted to get or buy. And um, like most teens, I wasn't, I just didn't have any experience, right? And I wasn't able to find or, you know, a job like anyone that was willing to give me a chance. Like I applied at every small business in my town, which is um, in Alameda, California, and no one would hire me. And also I had like some special work, you know, you're 14 years old, you can't, you know, your work permit, I think starts at 16. Like I had to get my parents to sign off. So I had another barrier to that, but um, I ran into someone who was doing this random business at the time, knocking on doors and painting address numbers on the curb of the street. And I, I literally ran into this person at the park and was just kind of talking to them and like, hey, you know, I've been looking for a job. I want to see what you're doing. Can I help you out for the day? And literally, I, I helped them out for um, two days and I realized that I can do that business myself. I was like, why am I working for this person? I was like, I can do this thing. And in suburban areas, as you guys know, like there's address numbers you paint on the curb of the streets, right? So you, you, you go up and down and you, you, there's a stencil, you like a certain type of paint that you use for asphalt. And I was like, I can do this. And I was helping him like just paint and do things. He was going door to door, knocking on the house residential doors. And he had this pitch and I just kind of learned from him in the two days. And I just remember thinking, um, I can do this. And I started putting the materials together. I went to a local paint store, talked about, you know, like what, what's needed, the technique and all of that, and just figured one thing out at a time. And I started painting, like I started knocking on doors myself and I was making a lot of money doing it. Right. So it was um, something that I just did on my own. And I really from there, I, I was like, I can grow this thing. And um, at, at age 14, I decided to get a business license. Like, I, you know, people were trying to help me out at the same time, letting me know that, hey, you know, you need the proper forms and all of these other things. So I got my first business license, learned about the politics of opening a business, which is, you know, registering with the city, um, getting all of these things. And I called it the Alameda Team Project. And we didn't charge for it, but we took donations. Um, and it was a way to offer teens, like teens my age, ways to get work experience, um, you know, stay out of the streets, stay out of trouble, do all of these things, um, but have a productive way to develop people skills by talking to people, helping the neighborhood, knowing the neighborhood, and we're all neighborhood kids. And I started off by hiring a buddy of mine who also had the same struggle, wasn't able to find a part-time job, and it just kind of ballooned up from there, and I grew it to 21 kids, and we ended up expanding into two, two neighboring cities, and it was this little enterprise that I ran at 14, 
And at one point we were doing like $2,000 a day in revenue. Wow. And it was, yeah, it was incredible. Like, you know, I had teams, you know, run, running up and down the block. I had two salespeople, one, you know, one painter. So then they would go knock on doors. They would have quotas to hit X amount of doors per day. Um, you know, and the, the painter would go back and forth. They'll go back to collect the donation. And we had a whole pitch, you know, like this is a team project. This is a nonprofit, you know, like. We're not taking any money, but we would love a donation and the average, you know, hey, John next door gave us, you know, $20 or $40. And then, you know, like Bob at the next door would then like, oh, yeah, we could match that donation or give more. It was um, and it just kind of became a much bigger thing than I ever anticipated. And it was kind of my journey into, um, yeah, the business world. That's an awesome story. This and this is all like before you're able to even to drive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I um I had a little scooter that I would um, like jet. I would be sweating because I would have to go visit my teams or I'll drop off lunch or, you know, check in on them. And also they were holding a lot of cash, right? Like we were, we were doing really well. So then I didn't want, you know, them to hold on to more than, you know, a hundred or two hundred dollars at a time. So then I would have to do these drops and pickups. And I just, you know, at one point it got so big, you know, I had to, I, I literally would pay, you know, my dad to, you know, they, hey, I need to hire you for the afternoon to, you know, to use a van, to do a couple of drops and pick up, especially when we were expanding to neighboring cities, you know, like that was new territory, right? So it's like, you know, we couldn't walk there. I couldn't take my, um, my scooter, but I ended up buying my first car before I even had my license. Like I bought my first car when I was like 15 years old. Right. And I like I bought it cash, like, you know, and I was like and my parents couldn't even argue with me because I was like, look, I'm running this little enterprise. Like I need wheels like um, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, you know, I think it really shows a lot about, you know, kind of you as a kid, your your want to uh, just have some have some spin in cash um, yeah. and the and the ability to not overthink of it uh, because. I mean, as, as adults, we do that all the time. We're like, okay, I need, I'm going to open whatever business and, and it's going to require me to do these, you know, laundry list of 80 things before I can ever even, you know, pick up a phone or, or knock on a door or whatever. But I think that, I think that if we're, if we're able to kind of put that, put that kid hat back on and say, you know what, I've got this thing that I can do. I have this skill that, you know, I've always said, if you have a truck, you have a business yep. and it doesn't even, I mean, it doesn't even have to go there. I was, I was having a garage sale this past weekend and I was selling a power washer. I think it was like yeah. 50 bucks or something like that. And I'm like, you know, if somebody comes and buys this and they want to do entrepreneur stuff, they have a business, you know, stick it in the trunk of your car, put it in the little red wagon and walk it around your neighborhood, whatever, you know, it does not take that much to start something small like this, especially if you're just getting started or if you're again, like what you were, you know, under, under the age of, you know, 16, 18, whatever. Uh, I think that there's so many opportunities out here for people to get true entrepreneurial experience without, you know, thinking that they need to call up a VC. It's huge. Absolutely. I think the simplicity of it is that there is an objective, right? And there's, it's just how do you how do you pursue and execute on that objective right and at the end of the day like i always say this from a business standpoint our job is like business owners or entrepreneurs just to solve one problem at a time right in order to get to that objective and like learning about you know a business license for the first time having to go to city hall for the first time can you imagine a 14 year old kid coming in to city hall and say hey i want to start a business right i just I remember um, the ladies that were working in that office and they were like, you want to do what? <laughs> like, and But they were so helpful, right? Like if there's a will, there's a way, right? And they were like, all right, these are the parameters. And obviously being a kid, like, you know, is this allowed? Is this not? Like there was, there was so many things and so many hurdles. But again, those are just one thing at a time. To your point, like whether it's a power washer or, they, you know, this was a, like I was a kid with an objective to do something. And it's like, how do I just eliminate all of these barriers to doing that one objective? And it's, you know, as as we get older, we make things more and more complicated and obviously life gets more complex and there's a lot of other external factors. But like anything else, it's just solving one problem at a time to get to that objective. 
I think that's solid advice. And I'm sure that I could keep talking about this type of, you know, business and, yeah. and this thing forever, but I better not do that. Let's get into the real reason you're here. Uh, tell us what is Do Good Points? Do Good Points is the first loyalty program for doing good. And essentially we are the first platform where you don't, a user doesn't have to spend a single dollar to do good. Right. So we are a social enterprise in its truest form. We comprise of a 501c3 foundation, as well as we are a startup tech company. So you've got the foundation and you've got the for profit. Um, what's the tell, tell us about the, the split of the structure. Um, how does that work? Yeah. So I would say the foundation is kind of the heartbeat of everything that we do. Right. Everything's under this one umbrella. But and the foundation's mission is what we call ROG. And just like ROI, return on investment when in capitalism and basic business world, ROG is return on giving. How do we take, you know, resources um, and solve the problems within the nonprofit space, which is marketing, activating the next generation of do-gooders and just finding a better way to do business within the nonprofit space to have greater impact. And that is the focus of the foundation, which leads and guides our corporation, which is a tech company where we build and aggregate technology, resources, data um, in order to provide these services for nonprofits free of charge and amplify their mission. Right. And on the corporate side, our mission as a company is to activate and empower the next generation of do-gooders. So, so tell us a little bit more about the, the business model on the for-profit side. Um, it sounds like there's some data collection, there's, there's uh, maybe some marketing and some other things. What's, what's, the, what's the business model on that side? Yeah, so it's, um, there's a couple different angles to it. I'll, I'll kind of break it down. The first being on the, as a platform, we are, think of us like a Yelp um, for nonprofits where you can go and find resources, find lo- whether it's like your local burrito shop or, you know, a nail salon or a bar, right? Like here at Do Good Points, you can go find your local animal shelter, uh, food bank, um, different ways to do good and connect to nonprofit organization. We aggregate data um, with about the nonprofit where you can access all 1.7 million nonprofits in the United States, but also get resources in regards to ratings, review systems, audits, um, impact data, and other things that make it more informative and easier to connect to nonprofits. And then from there on the platform, we also want to centralize the technology available in order to break down any barriers to doing good, right? So um, what's the easiest way to donate? Can I donate monthly? Um, or what are other financial tools and, and resources, whether it's crypto, donation match? Um, what we want to do is aggregate all of those services under one platform and make it easier to do good. So then just like Robinhood um, create, you know, created an app and a platform to make it easier to, to invest in stocks, right? So then over 50% of people that use Robinhood had never invested in stocks before. So they took something that was incredibly complicated or at least perceived to be complicated and simplified it and activated a younger generation to participate in something that they normally didn't participate in. And we say that for the same for philanthropy. It's like, you don't need to be a Bill Gates, you know, some billionaire to, to be involved in philanthropy and giving back. Like, how do you activate today? Um, and not having money is a big problem for the younger generation. So then it's like, there's other ways to connect, right? Doing good, sharing it on social media. And how do we activate those things from a platform? So you mentioned something about, you know, the young folks who, who do want to do good, but maybe financially isn't the number one way that they can do good so is is your platform offering something for these for these folks that monetarily may not be the best solution for them absolutely and we we've done a ton of research obviously like as a tech company we're we're very data driven uh we are one of the research projects we did with the phc program at saint mary's college where we try to really understand the psychology of the next generation and what they define as philanthropy or doing good and having impact. And one of um, the key findings was exactly what you said. They don't see themselves giving monetarily as a primary way to have impact, that it's not preferred, right? One, because their disposable income levels and things of that sort at that age obviously are not, you know, at, at the level um, that, you know, they will be when they hit the 40s or 50s or whatever it might be. Right. But also like there's interesting data to find out like they don't other user behaviors, but 
What we're looking into is then how do we lean into their behaviors like gamification, loyalty, um, finding fun ways and digital experience to engage. So then if they're not donating, can we part of, be part of a game? Can we be part of a social platform that they already are on and uh, find incentives and ways to engage them that add value to their identity, to their community, to whatever they're doing and um, doing good at being a part of that, right? So then you earn points for doing good, sharing something, and then you can convert that points into an actual cash donation or something else that, that has impact um, from a social level. What is Creators for Good? Great question. So Creators for Good is a, a program that we run internally on the platform where we activate influencers and creators, whether it's a gamer, social media person, uh, but essentially anyone can be a creator for good. Whether you have an influence over one person or millions of people, um, you can activate your community by talking about causes you care about, by using the platform that you have. Again, it doesn't matter if you have one follower or hundreds of thousands or millions of followers, like these are the people that are part of your community, your tribe, your family, your friends that can activate. And usually, you know, we're surrounded by like-minded people, right? If I care about a cause, I, you know, uh, my friend next to me usually will support me or care about the cause itself, right? So then how do we activate creators for good, whether, you know, again, a platform of one or platform of millions to activate and utilize their platform for good. Can you tell us the, um, what, uh, what impacts creators for good has had, um, so far? Yeah, so we actually just piloted the program last year, right? So we're looking to scale it this year. Um, some data points right off the top of my head. We reached over 8 million people um, in our events and, um, you know, campaigns and things of that sort that we've done. We raised over $320,000 um, in the pilot program. We've activated over 500 creators for good um, to host a campaign, a, a live stream, a social post anything that engages their community or friends and, and, and relatives in regards to causes that they care about. Um, we've activated and fundraised for over 120 nonprofits and causes, uh, whether through emergency funds or, you know, Black History Month or uh, mental health awareness, whatever it might be based on the creator um, being any individual and the cause they care about and like, how do they use their platform for that? It sounds it sounds like it was a pretty successful pilot program. It, it was, it, it, it absolutely was. And it just goes to the testament of like where the market is going with the younger generation, right? And part of that research study that we did, I was telling you about the number one way people activate, especially for social impact and doing good, nonprofits, anything else is through recommendations, right? You know, hey, my friend John, you know, volunteered at this local soup kitchen, that's where I'm gonna volunteer. Right. Or, you know, like Susie donated to this organization for this, these reasons. That's where I'm going to donate. Right. So just using the, the peer to peer as well as a social a aspect of it to really engage audiences. So let's jump into into the marketing that you all do. Um, so who is your target market specifically? Younger demographic. Ideally, uh, our sweet spot is between 25 to about 40 years old, 39, 40 years old, uh, millennials. And then we're also very successful with um, 18 to 24 as well. And again, it's activating the, the next generation of do-gooders. And some key data points that you should be aware of is that the average donor in the United States um, today is 65 years old, right? And it's you know, even through COVID, when we talk about like, you know, like everything going digital, there was a 30, 30 to 35% growth in digital donations that happened. And we're still only at 16% on a good day, right? So it doesn't, you know, it's not surprising because if the average donor is 65, then they're not, you know, usually using digital transactions, but talking about the next generation, it's like, how do we activate that? How do we convert that, right? So then our demographic is really focused on reaching that audience. So in your company profile, which people can find over at startupsavant.com, uh, you laid out a very detailed set of attributes for your target persona. And you actually laid out quite a few you know, details here as well. Can you tell us about how you and your team ideated and tested this persona in a way that allowed you to get so specific? Yeah, and um, so I'm gonna go back to some of our key research personas which is, you know, like there are people that are doing good already, um, people that are new to doing good, and then there are, you know, activists, 
right? So there's kind of different stages, right? And it's there's a lot of different ways to to think through it. Um, we look at the psychology uh, of it um, and uh, obviously the data behind it. But there's you know from a natural human instinct, like there's a mass high hierarchy of needs, right? Based on where you at are are at. In, in those kind of needs, human needs, like you, you know, different things take priority, right? And when it comes to our, our general like uh, personas, we look at, we're looking to activate people that are not already, you know, activated, but are curious, are thinking about it, are finding, trying to find ways as part of their identity for the causes that they care about, right? So we always say this, we want to be, we don't define what good is for someone, right? We want you to help discover that process for yourself and it's a personal journey. Right. So it's not, you know, that we try to guide p- per someone like, Hey, this cause is more important than that cause. I think every individual person's story is different. And those personas then is to really guide them depending on where they are, they are at in their stage. And I would say our sweet spot is activating new um, people, younger generations that are just figuring out the causes that they care about. Um, and it's incredible to do that now in this age because the younger generation is more informed and they care more about it than ever before, right? And so then we also don't believe in the competition of doing good. So we're not, if someone is already activated and involved and is already a strong part of their identity, we're not trying to take them away from something that they're already doing, right? So then how do we offer tools and resources to activate them? So these, those three personas are really kind of meeting them where they're at and providing sort resources, technology and tools to amplify them along their journey as they, as they mature as, as givers, as, as do-gooders. Yeah, it sounds, and obviously you've put a lot of thought into this and to, to kind of be able to, you know, um, put the different the different groups into different buckets and and to treat them each slightly differently obviously all with the same goal of allowing them to do good um and i think that this is something that any business and any founder really should spend a lot of time uh putting together these personas and truly 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 understanding who it is that they are that they're serving Um, And you mentioned specifically that it's very data driven. Can you tell us what kind of data that you're looking at and where you are finding this data? Absolutely. Um, It's it's definitely from it's product led. Right. So all of the features and things that we want to provide and prioritize is based on what the market tells us. So I always say this, this do good point is not some founder vision where, you know, I'm like the Steve Jobs is like, I have this vision. Let's build this thing to the T. Right. Where. I say we are, we're market driven, right? The, the public and the people will tell us what we need to prioritize and what we need to build, right? Um, and when it comes to the data piece of it, like I'm going to share some key data points that we found in our study and how we correlate that to products within our, our, our platform. One of the big research studies that we did, it's like, you know, again, what are the barriers for you to do good, right? Why don't you volunteer more or donate or whatever that might be? Um, one of the key findings that we found that was very surprising for us was that they, the younger generation actually doesn't care about nonprofit organizations. They don't care specifically about XYZ organization. They care about the cause. The organization itself is actually a barrier for them to do good because trust is a huge factor. Who's running the organization? Is, is it, are, you know, what age are they? Like all of these other comments and questions are become barriers that, that keep them from activating to engage with that organization or to volunteer or whatever else. Right. So then, for example, we take that data and create funds. So if you don't care about XYZ nonprofit, but you care about climate action. We created a fun product where, you know, we'll aggregate like the top 10 nonprofits within that cast category based on reviews, um, you know, ratings and whatever else. So then we've done all the legwork for you and now you can support this cause. Right. So, you know, things of that sort, like recommendations, social platforms. Again, that was, you know, that was an easy one for us to figure out like, hey, they, you know, like a lot of people want to do good, but they also don't want to do all the legwork. And that's okay. You know, you need to start somewhere and that's what technology is for, right? You know, tech, technology allows us to simplify and kind of do a lot of the legwork for us. So then how do we aggregate that, this type of data, make it easier and present it in a way that's more digestible, right? Um, and those are the, the data points that we look at to develop every feature that we have. 
But I think that the key thing is also to really make it fun and engaging, right? To the loyalty, the gamification aspect of it. Those are things that are already part of our human psyche, right? Like those are natural behaviors that we have and that the private sector utilizes very, very well, right? Loyalty programs, points, games, in-game, like rewards, badges, and things of that sort. How do we incorporate that into doing good? Right into behaviors that are not normally rewarded in our daily lives. How do we engage that part of it? So you mentioned putting together studies specifically, you know, it sounds like a very, very uh, concerted effort to go into your pool of data, your pool of, of data points and pull things out. Is Are these studies something that you already knew how to do? Is this something that you brought on some sort of third party to help you put together some real, you know, scientific quote unquote studies or how did you how did you manage these studies one i i mean i personally have uh, i'm a sociology major like i have a personal like just love and passion for social psychology like what drives people and like what you know that's essentially what business is right and um so there's a deep like you know passion for it i would say i'm definitely not an expert and but from there the tech industry is is notorious and this is what you know the tech industry does so well like user user research right like you know the product side of things and really digging into that and we you know we're being a tech company we operate in, in that same manner but again our product is different we're not you know we're not selling an app or some other service or product but it is it is doing good it's social impact right so then utilizing those best practices within the tech space and applying it to this sector and the, the human psyche of doing good. Um, that, that, that was a challenge, but that's also what made it fun, right? Like that's, that was the challenge we wanted to take on. And then in addition to that, you know, bringing in research specialists, um, we had people like Yesha on our team that, that came in whose entire background is, is research, right? And social impact. So then utilizing that, you know, from a big enterprise level to kind of our startup, you know, like solving the problems that we're doing. And then I, I mentioned, you know, utilizing outside, outside resources like the St. Mary's PhD program, which is an educational program. Um, they dedicated an entire course for us one quarter to develop a survey. It took months to develop one survey to ask the right questions for us to get the right data that we need in order to build and prioritize the right features that we wanted to do on our platform, right? So using outside factors to make sure, because when it comes to research and surveys, it's sometimes it's how and what question you ask that will ultimately make all the difference, right? So then really putting a lot of thought into that and like getting the responses and the data points that we really needed. That's huge. I think that, I think that thinking that deeply is probably the level that people need to get to. I don't think that they need to get to that on the first day. Obviously, like yeah. you said, you know, these studies, some of them took months to get put together. Uh, but I think that, you know, if, if you're finding some sort of uh, success and, and you want to continue moving that forward, I think that this is, this is an area where it, it will pay back in gigantic multiples to, to know your people better. Um, Absolutely. so let's, let's talk about how you're, how you're reaching this market. Um, what are the kind of channel or channels that you are finding best suited to get into the, the eyes of this market? Yeah, I would. So being in, in the nonprofit space, you know, that, that was, I've never worked in this space before, right? I've been involved through my family and just, you know, personal. So coming into this space, it was, it was a tough learning experience. Right. And. I remember when I first started Do Good Points, one of the first things I did was like, I was like, I'm gonna go to every nonprofit conference I can find and the biggest ones and just really kind of submerge myself in this space. And, you know, cause we were trying to figure out like, is this the right problem that we're solving, right? Like, how do we fit into this space? Like, cause I didn't want to be another nonprofit. Like, I feel like that's the last thing this, this world needs is like another nonprofit, right? So when I go to these conferences, what, the majority of them, the keynotes were always talking about the younger generation, how to reach them. Um, but none of them fucking talked about like how to actually do it. They just kept talking about the importance of it. Right. Um, because like, you know, donors aging out, like is the, you know, again, the average donor is 65 years old. Like they're literally passing away and there's no one else taking their place. So these nonprofits are shutting down left and right because they have no strategies. So, you know, like, 
those were the things that I, I figured out, but it's like, how do we then reach these audiences? We, we go to where they're at, you know, like if they're on Twitch playing a video game, we go to that platform. It's not a, if I build it, they will come scenario. It's like, how do we go into the marketplace, provide value, provide, you know, like fit into that space, you know, fill the gaps where, you know, where we are solving our problem and, and reach them there. Right. Um, it wasn't just like, if I build it, they will come scenario. So, um, to answer that question, you know, we're going into the marketplace where younger de- generations are spending their time, social media, Twitch, gaming, um, loyalty programs, retailers, um, and participating in their daily lives and fill- solving the problems of getting them to activate doing good within the space that they're already in. Did you have some familiarity with platforms like Twitch and, you know, YouTube gaming and all these other uh, streaming platforms for gamers and creators? Did you have, did you have familiarity with that or is that something that was new to you? So gaming specifically was definitely new to me. Um, I just, that wasn't, gaming just wasn't something I did growing up. I was, you know, I was running a business at 14. It didn't give me a lot of time to play video games, right. to be honest. Um, you know, I played like you know, things growing up, like Street Fighter, Tekken and stuff like that when I was a kid. Um, but like, you know, that's completely different from what the world of gaming is today, right? Like, and the whole streaming. So that particular space is is absolutely new and I'm still learning it and I'm very upfront about it. So we have amazing teams and, you know, agencies that we work with that allow, you know, me to learn and grow in that space. But outside of that, um, I was previously at a tech company where, you know, we did like big loyalty marketing campaigns um, with big programs like airlines, um, banks and institutions that engage uh, massive audiences for engagement for a private sector. Right. So if Best Buy ran a campaign to do research or, you know, to find more about their customers, engage them. I was at a company that that activated those kind of programs. So then utilizing those that like that experience, those resources is kind of where the genesis of Do Good Points was as well. All right. I'm going to take a very hard left turn here and ask you, yeah. what is effective altruism? Man, um, Thanks for asking that question. I love to talk about this and I've learned that I need to explain it from a very basic level because one, I'm not an expert at it, but two, um, it's usually a new thought, but essentially the way I like to explain it and there's more to it than this. And I challenge everyone to, to search and research it themselves, but it is the idea that what I'm doing is this the best way to do it? That's simply put, like if I have 10 hours in a day, what's the best way to use that 10 hours? Right. Um, but more specifically, if I can do good, what is the best way for me to do good? So from a monetary standpoint, if I only have a hundred dollars, where's the best place I can donate this hundred dollars to? Right. That's a simple idea. And it's like, I want to have the maximum, well, um, you know, and again, what we call ROG, return on giving. Right. If I give this hundred dollars, I want this hundred dollars to do have the maximum impact that it can have. Outside of that, if I am a, you know, a a digital marketer, right? Someone that's been in the tech industry, you know, like, you know, I get paid X amount of dollars, a large sum of money to do something I'm very good at. I have a high expertise in, and then I go volunteer on the weekend on a Saturday, 10 hours at a local soup kitchen. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But from an effective altruism standpoint, was that the best way for me to spend those 10 hours? Was that going to have the greatest impact that I'm able to have by utilizing my knowledge, my resources, my my entire network or whatever it is? Like, was that the best ten, way to spend 10 hours? Probably not. Right. And so then it's like, how do we, you know, utilizing what we have, do the best that we can. Right. And that's the simple ideology and kind of exactly where, you know, how I approach my personal journey with do good points and, you know, everything else. Do you have a, a framework that you use or a series of steps uh, to ensure that you are using your resources, whether that be time or funds or uh, attention in the most impactful way? Absolutely. But I hesitate to say this, be, um, to share it because it always changes. I think at different seasons of my life, um, 
talking just purely about Duga points, but just in work in general, there were different focuses, right? I'm a very different person than I was when I started my first business when I was 14. I had very different objectives and agendas than I do now. So then I think those frameworks constantly change, but ultimately it always starts with just why. Like, why am I going to do what I'm going to do? Why am I pursuing this business? And just really the whole Simon Sinek model, right? It's like, what is the why? What is the reasoning, like the foundation to this entire endeavor, right? And I think that is the the starting point, the genesis for, for anything. So I, I would always like that based on that why, the what and the how always changes, right? Because depending on how that why is, it's like I'm always looking for the fastest way to get to that why. Right. right. And what is what are the distractions? What are the things I need to cut away in order to get to that? Why as fast and soon as possible? Right. So now that you found the why. OK, so I, I I'm going to press you a little bit because I'm really yeah. interested. I like the Absolutely. way you think. So I want to get in there. So we're not necessarily looking for answers at this point. What we're looking for is the questions. So once you st- you start with why am I doing this? Once you kind of have answered that question, what's the next question that you ask yourself to make sure that you are taking not just a path to, you know, the goal, but the best path, the best, most effective path? That's great. And I love what Tony Robbins says about this. He says the, the quality of your life is determined by the quality of the questions that you ask. Right. And I absolutely believe that. So then to your point, spending the proper amount of time to figure out the right questions to ask, right? Because once you figure out the why, then it's like, you know, there's so many questions that come up and a lot of questions oftentimes start with just problems. I think the problems, we don't need to get in a rush to to reach problems. It's like finding out the questions first, it's like, all right, like what are the type of problems that I want to solve? Why do I want to solve this problem? And just digging into that more and more and, and really figuring out how I fit into it, right? Being honest with myself, realistic with myself in regards to like, what are my strengths? Leaning into my strengths rather than, you know, trying to solve for all of the areas that I, I have, I lack or weaknesses, right? And then identifying those things because I want to go the path of least resistance, right? And I think as an entrepreneur, it's not so much that, you know, we lack resources, we lack resourcefulness, right? So then the way to activate the resourcefulness is really to ask the right questions, right? So then the the next frame of questions to that why is just really figuring out like these questions need to lead to this path of least resistance to get to my why, right? And I hope I'm I'm doing a good job answering your question, but it's like, you know, it's every scenario is obviously very different, right? And then letting the problems kind of discover themselves, right? Instead of looking for problems. I think what I've seen in a lot of entrepreneurship, like people are looking for problems to solve. It's like, that's a terrible way to run a business or to pursue something, right? Like, I don't want problems. Problems just happen. Yeah. Problems are just surprises I didn't want. Yeah, because you know what's going to happen when you look for them. You're going to find them. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly right. Like, and it's like, I don't, I don't need to go hunting for problems. Like those things will come, right? I need to go look for solutions and find a path of least least resistance because again, the problems is, is just, that's what I need to minimize. That's my job, right? As a founder, as an entrepreneur, that's my job, right? Is, and then finding the right people to help me solve those problems. All right. I love that answer. So I'm stoked that we, uh, I'm stoked that we took that, that one step deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, All right. Um, tell us what surprised you about entrepreneurship. Man, there's so many surprises, right? And I think there's a lot of different ways that I can answer this, but, um, I think the one thing that really, you know, just being vulnerable and to share that openly with you is just the surprise of like being responsible for others. And I, you know, like there was not, there's nothing that prepares you for that, you know, and I think that's one of the biggest barriers to, to entrepreneurship and doing good. And I say this and mo- unless you run a business yourself, like it's, it's really hard to explain to other founders or other, other, you know, I mean, not to other founders, but to other people is that if it was just me, I can deal with it. I have a really high risk tolerance. I know exactly what I'm getting myself into and I can be responsible for myself. But when you're responsible for the livelihood of others, their income, their family, their, their livelihood, the amount of pressure that it puts on, you know, 
on me and other founders to, to be, you know, the person that's leading, to be the visionary, to be, you know, the boss, to be whatever you want to call it. Um, that pressure is just, you can't explain it. And that pressure only grows as you grow, you know, as your business grows, like, and the responsibility behind that. And that surprised me because oftentimes you start a business because you're fired up, right? Like, I'm like, I want to do this. I have this problem. Like, you know, like there's this problem I want to solve. Like, these are, this is my why, all of those things. But how often do people think about others first, right? Because I'm not going to go on this journey by myself. But did I spend enough time thinking about, um, you know, thinking about who's going to join this journey with me? What's the process of this journey? And that's something I've learned over the years. And obviously, when I was 14, I started my first business. Um, that was the beginning of this journey. But at every stage, as I grow and as I mature, that is the one piece that continues to surprise me. Um, but also, it continues to bless me, right? That is the blessing of this journey. Um, yeah, let me pause there. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you nailed it. I mean, awesome. That was, I didn't know what your answer was going to be. Uh, so, yeah, yeah you, uh, you knocked it out of the park. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to elaborate more. Well, I guess there's, there's one thing I will share. Like, everyone says, like, now that I'm in like the philanthropy and nonprofit industry, like, oh, great, you know, like this, that's amazing, you know, and it's like, nah, I don't feel warm and fuzzy every day. <laughs> like, you know, that's just not the fucking case. Like, uh, oftentimes, it's work. You know what I mean? Like I show up to work like anyone else shows up to work. And yes, it's a blessing to be in the space that I'm in, but it's also incredibly frustrating and not every cause I'm fired up about. Right. Or I'm like, it's not, I'm not like weeping over everything or every tragedy that happens. Like, like I, I wouldn't be able to do my job every day if, if that was the case, it would be too exhausting. Um, but one thing that is consistent in addition, adding to that question is that I, I show up every day to work with the people that I'm working with, right? To do good with our team first before we can ever do good externally, right? And that is a blessing of working and starting this business. And it, it took me a lot of years to figure out and get to this point, but that is what my job is, is to serve them and to, and to do, if I can't do good with them, I'm not going to do good with anyone else, right? And, you know, if they don't believe in a mission, then no one else is going to believe in a mission. And I think that is the, the greatest challenge, but also the, the greatest blessing. So you may have answered this. You may have given some some points to the answer to this. But what how do you deal with it? Like you've you've learned over and over that this is the thing. This pressure is the thing that continues to surprise you. What do you do? I mean, do you do you do you are you just an excellent meditator or um, <laughs> uh, is there a book that, that we should all read or what what uh, what do you do? Um, that's a great, I think, I think there's a lot of different things. There's a couple of things that I, that stand out to me and that become incredibly important to me. Um, but I believe in servant based leadership. I, I believe that, you know, the founder or the boss's job is to serve the people that, that are, that are making the mission possible. So my job in, in finding the best ways to do this is to how do I empower and enable them to do what they do best, right? And I believe everyone on our team, everyone I work with have, have a mission. And it's like, how do I amplify that? And learning ways to serve them better is what I put my energy into. So to your point, meditating, finding ways to make sure that, you know, that I'm, you know, that, that my ego, that, you know, things that are unhealthy, um, in my development are not getting in the, in the way of doing my purpose and reason to serve, right? So being, being part of CEO groups and other groups that really focus on that same philosophy and mindset as well. Um, I'm part of a group um, that meets once a month of founders and CEOs that focus on servant based leadership, right? And kind of finding other and healthy ways to really like grow teams, um, not just from a, you know, business objective, but really amplify like the mission from inside out. Right. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in, but obviously being in the industry that I'm in, it's a little bit more amplified. Right. So then it's like really serving that and finding avenues to, to develop those skills, because like anything else, um, I need to con constantly learn and grow um, in order to exercise those muscles. All right. We're working on some great stuff here. I hope uh, I hope everyone's uh, got their pen and pad out because they've they've got some notes to take here, um, and probably some homework too. But uh, we're gonna move on. What is next for Do Good Points? I'm so excited for this next phase. Um, we 
we are finally ready to really scale our efforts. So we had so many programs that we've piloted and launched and really trying to figure out exactly um, where our priorities are, right? So what's next for Do Good Points? Um, we are looking to scale our Creators for Good um, program, uh, scale our partnerships, really go into the marketplace and amplify, you know, the successes that we've seen. Right. So last year we grew, you know, 1500%, right. In, in an eight month period and really kind of leaning into those strengths and areas this year. Um, and then growing our team internally as we amplify those efforts. We also have a number of really large partnership deals that we've been working on for some for over two years that are, you know, kind of reaching the end of its sales cycle, um, partnership development cycle. And we're really excited to get those things going. Um, but also I, you know, constantly adapting again to the marketplace, right? And letting the market tell us where, you know, and direct where our initiatives and, and goals are. And one of the things that we're really excited about is obviously the whole buzz right now is about AI and how, you know, that's changing, you know, the tools and services that we use. But when I think about AI and how it can change and serve the nonprofit space, I, I get incredibly excited about that, right? And traditionally, the nonprofit space is way behind on technology, right? Like, you know, again, I told you, like only 16% of the market right now donates digitally, which is a huge problem. Um, but, you know, as a tech company that's looking to amplify our mission, like when I think about, you know, AI and uh, introducing those type of services into our space, I get super excited about that. Sounds like there's a lot going on. Sounds like we've got a lot to look forward to. All Absolutely. right, we're gonna we're gonna hit my favorite question um, because I just love what comes out of it. What is your number one piece of advice for early stage entrepreneurs? Man, I, I want to give this some serious thought. That's a good yeah, you've one. Got time. Um, yeah, I start with why. You know, I, I, I want to quote Simon Sinek, like our why drives us. It's the only thing that will feed us because the struggle is real. Like it is so fucking real. The problems are so real, like, and they will be endless. And the barriers as, you know, if you've been, if you've been on this road long enough, you know, like it, it just wears you down, right? It just continues to wear you down. But the only thing that you can keep you going is, is your why. And to be honest with yourself, right? Because I think oftentimes I, f I see a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs and business people that, that do it for the wrong reason. Like, oh, I just want to make more money. I want to. And those things can only take you so far. Right. And the things that will really, you know, be tried and true and, and, and withstand the test of time is like when there is a meaning and there's a mission that's greater than you, that why will is is what is what will drive you. That will like, cause, because again, the problems are endless, you know, and it's persistence, um, that will persevere. And the only thing that will continue to continue to drive us is, is that purpose and that reason. And whatever that is for every individual, um, you know, it doesn't, you know, like you, you will find ways to make impact, um, but your why needs to drive, drive you in regards to, to, to reaching those goals. That is an excellent piece of advice. Um, and of course that, uh, that comes from the book called start with why from Simon Sinek. Um, Absolutely. and just for the uh, folks listening out there, we'll put a link up to that in the show notes. So if you want to, if you want to really do your homework on this, you can go pick up that book and, and check it out. Um, all right. Last question, where can people connect with you online and how can our listeners support do good points? I would love to connect with people that are on this mission. Um, LinkedIn will probably be the best way from a business standpoint. Um, and Andy Choi, um, do good points. And as far as support, we're always looking for partners in our mission. Um, any company, any brand can, can amplify their corporate responsibility. There's cause marketing, social impact. All of the data shows that the younger generation want to connect with brands that have a stance in regards to the, the area that they do business whether that's having a local impact um, or to having a greater, bigger impact within the cost space itself. Um, and those are barriers to brands and companies because you focus on what you do best. Um, amplify and use, you know, the platform that you have by partnering with companies like Do Good Points or nonprofits that are experts within the space that you want to approach to and, and you know, work with us, right? We're happy to guide you in the right, you know, in the right direction, whether that's with or without us. Um, but we think every brand and every company should absolutely make that a priority. 
Where should those brands reach out to? Um, they can reach out to me directly at andy at dugatpoints.com. Sweet. All right, Andy, this has been so much fun. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, hopefully I see do good points on every stream that I watch uh, from this point forward. Uh, that would be that would be really awesome. Um, Absolutely. And folks listening, we're going to put everything you heard today in the show notes over at startupsavant.com slash podcast. Andy, thank you. Thank you for coming on. This has been great. Thank you so much for having me and appreciate you um, doing good together with us. The Startup Savant Podcast is produced by Truick.